Okay, so François will resume his uh, course. So this is his last talk. Thank you. Welcome back. Does this? Yeah, you can hear me, right? I'm going to finish the proof of the theorem that I just got to state uh, last time at the end of the lecture. So let me recall the, the setup. We had a, a group which was a, a right-angled coxeter group. So by definition, this is generated by sigma 1 through sigma n, such that any product sigma i, sigma j, raised to the m i j integer equals 1, where m i i is just 1, and m i j is otherwise symmetric in i j, and either 2 or infinity. Infinity meaning there's no relationship. Um, so from this data, we built a Coxter matrix, so let me call it C sub T. Um, which had one on the diagonal, the size is n. And at the other entries, the, uh, the coefficient was T if Mij is infinite. And zero if mij equals two. Uh, t being a, any number less than minus one. So uh, just for, uh, there's some notation I'm going to use later on. By definition, the scalar product uh, like this, indexed by t, is just the scalar product of x and uh, m y. So it's just the scalar product whose matrix is uh, is the given. Uh, sorry, c c t y uh, with respect to the standard pairing. and the Euclidean uh, product on Rn. And um, all right, so given this, there was this standard Winberg representation, rho sub t from gamma to the uh, orthogonal group of our linear form. So. SO of RN endowed with CT, or the, the bilinear product, uh, taking sigma i to uh, the reflection in EI perp T. So that's the orthogonal of the ith basis vector. Um, with respect to the, the bilinear product T. And Winberg's theorem was from the 70s saying that the um, this representation, rho T of gamma, acts properly discontinuously On a um, on a properly convex properly convex means convex and and uh, bounded in some affine chart convex subset omega t of what I'm going to call the hyperbolic space H t. It's not a Euclidean hyperbolic space. It's just um, the projectivized cone of uh, negative vectors, so 
x is such that x paired with itself is negative. Um, all right, so the picture to have in mind is that ht is maybe a copy of hpq, h21 in this uh, drawing. So it's the, the inside. And your omega t is some, some sort of convex set here. Um, and moreover, Winberg gives you a lot more. He, he tells you what, the, what a fundamental domain is. A fundamental domain. is going to be um, the following polyhedron, P sub T. You projectivize um, the intersection of all uh, indices of uh, whatever is beyond the reflection wall. So X such that uh, X paired against EI is negative. So those are the, those are the, that's the, the region bounded by the reflection walls. And you, you have to truncate off uh, a little bit to, to, to uh, uh, prevent this from uh, spilling beyond HT. Uh, but what you truncate by is just the, the positive octant. So the sum of R plus EI. Again, those are the reflection walls. And this is the truncation. And the, um, the in, in our, in our running example, picture to have in mind again is that if CT is a three by three matrix with T's everywhere off diagonal, then you had um, HT, that's a copy of the hyperbolic plane. You had the reflection walls and the truncation walls or the truncation hyperplanes somewhere here. So PT is that compact region here. Um, if I extend uh, out there, I'm going to get EI as the uh, the, vertices, the, the vertices of the truncation simplex and EI perp as the walls of the reflection simplex. The relationship between these two being that if you, if you draw the, all the, the lines through EI that, that are tangent to the quadric, they are going to be tangent at points, at the points where the reflection wall exits the quadric. Okay, so under that setup, the claim of contraction was that um, if S and T in that order are two uh, numbers below minus one, uh, then the projective map um, taking the, uh, the fundamental domain for rho t to uh, rho s to the fundamental domain for rho t. So um, p sub s to p sub t uh, taking reflection walls to reflection walls. Uh, 
Uh, this map is contracting, so let, let's give it a name, phi sub st. It's contracting uh, in space-like directions. relatively to the pseudo distances defined on uh, HS and HT, so. Those are the, the distances defined by um, um, cross ratios in, uh, in the same way as, uh, as for the hyperbolic space, so this is HS and it, when you have two points, you compute where the line crosses the Q A B, where the line crosses the, the quadric line through PQ. The pseudo distance is just the log of the cross ratio A. So again, this restricts to a hyperbolic metric on, on any slice that looks ellipsoidal, but it's not a, not a distance in general for general pairs of points. Okay. So let's prove this. Uh, that's just for effect, I guess. Well, the, the reason is that if you take this definition on, on, a, on a ball, on a round ball, then the one half makes the curvature, the standard definition of curvature equal to minus one. Otherwise you have a scaled copy of the hyperbolic plane. Um, okay, so let's write down the, uh, uh, well, I mean, okay, let's first step back a little bit. <clears throat> we have a continuously varying family of uh, metrics and a continuously family varying, fa uh, so metrics, D twiddle, because the, 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 the quadrics are continuously varying. And we also have a continuously varying family of reflection walls, because they are reflection walls with, with respect to the orthogonals of fixed vectors relative to a varying uh, bilinear form. So everything changes at the same time, and we have to sort of keep track uh, to compute the compression rate. So what I'm going to do is map everything over uh, in the following way. If I have Rn with its uh, scalar product indexed by T and the reflection walls Ei perp T, if I use the matrix Ct um, to push it forward, I might at some point write MT instead of CT, just because I have a different uh, notation in my notes. If you catch me doing this, please uh, say it. Um, if I map it over by CT, what I'm going to see are the, uh, is a new scalar product, prime T, and the walls I need to reflect in are the, um, I want the full, the full family of walls, one I n. I guess the, the perp should be inside here. The I perp, the family of walls. I claim that here the correct notion of perpendicularity is just the, for the standard scalar product. EI perp zero, just the Euclidean, so these, these are the, the, the walls of the standard octant. Um, one I N. Um, proof, indeed. Um, 
Well, what does it mean for uh, X to belong to EI perp T? That just means that X, I mean, transpose of X, uh, CT EI equals zero. That also means that Transpo uh, transpose of X C T C T inverse times C T E I equals zero. And that also means that C T X belongs to E i perp zero, right? We're just simplifying this product. Uh, so the, the reason this is beneficial is that, is that now we have fixed walls and only a varying uh, scalar product. Um, so let me write a, uh, express this in the form of a, uh, of a quadratic, uh, sorry, a, a commutative diagram. Uh, if I go from the polyhedron, so I think I called PT was the projectivized polyhedron, the projectivized fundamental domain. So up in the vector space, let's call it twiddle, P twiddle uh, S, endowed with the scalar product of time S, is mapped over by phi ST to P Tweedle T with its scalar product. And here, if I map over by C and C S, I'm just pushing forward, so this is an, 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 an isometry. Um, I'm going to get delta, the uh, standard uh, orthant. bounded by the, the reflection walls in the e, e hyperps for the standard Euclidean, uh, Euclidean product. Um, scalar product S prime. Uh, sorry, did I say? Uh, there's something missing here. S prime. I haven't said yet what what the uh, what the push forward is. What the matrix of this uh, of this push forward uh, uh, push forward uh, uh, scalar product is, and that maps over by the identity because it's the same reflection walls. Uh, delta E prime scalar product, and this map is uh, CS, sorry, CT. Um, and here, okay, what is the, the scalar product uh, that I need here? Y paired up according to the, the um, scalar product T is just transpose of X times CT times Y. That's the transpose of X CT times CT inverse times CT Y. Uh, and therefore, the, uh, these, are the, these are the push forwards. CT, uh, sorry, this CT should be on the other side. CTX. Uh, these are the push forwards. So uh, the matrix of the scalar product prime at time t is the inverse as matrix uh, CT inverse. So 
now we are looking at the identity on the, a varying family of uh, scalar products whose matrices are given by the inverse of something explicit. Um, Okay, and I claim that contraction amounts to the property that um, the, the hyperbolic, the pseudo hyperbolic space corresponding to, to one of those uh, uh, scalar products prime is, is nested within the other. So um, it amounts to the, the correct direction is I should have. A smaller hyperbolic space, H according to C T or C S inverse, nested within H corresponding to C T inverse, where still S is less than T is less than minus one. Uh, inclusion of hyperbolic spaces, uh, well, pseudo hyperbolic spaces. Namely, if you have this, uh, this uh, sort of monotonicity in the, in the sense of inclusion, then you have monotonicity of the, um, of the cross ratios, and therefore the distances in one, in one uh, metric are less than in the other. Uh, so what do you do in order to check this? Well, you, you can check this differentially. You pick a point here on the boundary of um, H, so let's just call this H S prime. Um, so <coughs> to check inclusion, take X in the boundary at infinity of H S prime. So what this means is that X scalar X for the vectors for the scalar product S prime uh, is zero. And that by definition is transpose of X times C of S inverse times X. And I want to write it for this for some reason transpose of CS inverse X times CS times CS inverse X. I'm going to call this point uh, Y. Now, um, remember CS was identity minus, well, plus uh, S times a certain matrix that had entries zero and one, uh, zero or one, depending on, on, on the pair ij. If I call that matrix, uh, I call it C, then this pairing here is actually just the square norm of y. That's the identity part of CS uh, plus S times uh, Y C Y. And this being zero means that Y C Y is positive, right? Because uh, the squared norm, that is just the Euclidean, the Euclidean squared norm of Y and S is negative. So for this to be zero, I need the, the two to compensate. Okay, and <clears throat> it, uh, what you want to check for, for this uh, kind of nestedness is that if you take the pairing, uh, let's see. So the, the pairing is zero on the surface, it's negative inside and positive outside, and the other pairing on the other surface is similarly zero minus plus. So what you want to do is check that at this point x, if you, if you compute 
uh, the pairing of x against itself and then differentiate with respect to s, this, this is of a certain sign that will tell you that the, that the quadric is expanding at, at x, at this time, uh, sign s. So let's do this. of um, d over ds of uh, x against x s prime. That's um, d over ds of x uh, Cs inverse transpose of x, sorry, Cs x This is also, so we are just differentiating. There's a famous exercise where you differentiate matrix inversion. So this is transpose x d over ds Cs inverse x and the exercise says that this is uh, CS inverse D over DS CS. CS inverse, right? Uh, times X. And here, so D over DS S is our matrix C. And the other the the other uh, well the other factors are y and y transpose so we get exactly the transpose here so we know the sign of this um, uh, sorry positive and that gives the result it says that the the quadrix expand in the correct direction. Okay, so uh, the, um, I'm done proving the, the the contraction property of this family of representations. And remember, the reason we were, we were doing all of this is corollary using theorem three of the first lecture. Uh, the Cox, uh, right angled Coxter group gamma acts properly discontinuously by affine transformations. On, um, on the Lie algebra of S O uh, C T, I guess. And depending on your choice of T, the the, the signature of this uh, matrix C T might take on several different values. It won't be de degenerate uh, for generic T because if you take T equals zero, this is the identity matrix. So the, the determ is determined is a polynomial in T that does not vanish, but it might change signs a number of times, and at those times you have uh, changes in signature. So these could be several different um, uh, Lie groups for the same Coxter group, and you, you get an affine uh, properly discontinuous action for each of them. Um, so <clears throat> let me mention. I mean, there's a whole industry of embedding interesting groups into Coxter groups, right angled Coxter groups, and so on. So let me mention the, um, the, some of the main consequences. There exists similarly uh, affine, properly discontinuous actions. by uh, 
right angled uh, artin groups. So what is an artin group? It's uh, a right angled artin group. It's, it's generated by sigma one, sigma n, together with some, uh, well, it, it, it's the same presentation as the Coxa group that I gave, except you drop the condition that every generator is an involution. So whenever you have two generators, Maybe you declare them to commute, or maybe you don't, and that's all you do. And it turns out that a right-angled Artin group can be embedded in a, in a right-angled Coxter group with more generators, not the same sigma i's. And those embeddings yield, um, yield uh, properly discontinuous actions for free. Uh, so this is, uh, so I mean, th this is this is all going to be due to known embedding results, right? So so uh, the Corresponding names here are Davis and Januszkiewicz. Uh, embeddings. There are also um, results to the effect that, in fact, if you take any uh, Coxter groups, any Coxter group, it can be embedded virtually um, in a right-angled one. Uh, and this is due to Haglund and Wise. So again, a, a, a non-Coxter a group in general, not right-angled, is the uh, is given by a presentation where you have n involutions and the product of any two of them has some order, maybe two, maybe infinity, but maybe a, a different integer. And the two, three, seven group that I gave the other, the other day, for instance, is is one such group. So up to finite index, it embeds in in uh, in, uh, in a right angled Coxer group of some higher dimension. Um, now there's a uh, there, there, there is a lot of interest nowadays in cubulated delta hyperbolic groups, world hyperbolic groups. So that's Eagle, building on many de definitions by uh, Wise. Um, so what is a cubulated delta hyperbolic group? Well, there is a, uh, if you assemble cubes of varying dimensions subject to, a, to certain local uh, conditions, you, you get for free that the, that the fundamental group of, your, of the complex that's created is, is delta hyperbolic. And Hegel, so as part of his, uh, his proof of the virtual Haken conjecture, that the, the cubulate delta hyperbolic groups embed in right angle Dalton groups. So um, in particular, and this was the, the whole impetus for Eagle, uh, the, um, if you take the fundamental domains, so sorry, fundamental groups, of a, let's say a compact, hyperbolic manifold, free manifold. Then it falls under this heading, and that, that, that those were earlier results by uh, Sagayev, I guess. Sagayev and Karl Markovich. So that, that's, those are results with strong three-dimensional topology flavor. And uh, yeah, I guess all these groups have nice affine actions. Okay, so let me <clears throat> let me switch gear now, and I'll uh, I'll summarize a little bit of the history of, of this subject of uh, proper discontinuous affine actions. Uh, and after after that, I'm going to 
show a little bit of what has been done in other directions. I mean, other than, than finding, um, finding um, more and more interesting discrete groups, you could, you could also try to go in other directions. So history. History, uh, the, um, you could say that the origin of the subject is in, uh, is in crystallography because around 1890, uh, Schoenflies and Theodorov independently uh, showed the following. There exists um, 219 different, uh, well, uh, exactly 219 uh, lattices of a co compact, properly discontinuous actions. R3 by isometries um, up, to up to conjugation in the affine group. In um, R3. Um, if you, so the, the result is a little, little bit more precise than this. It says uh, all of them are virtually um, translation lattices. So just uh, Z3 acting on R3, maybe in some sort of slanted way, but just by translations. And in fact, they say a little bit more, if you, if you only allow conjugation by oriented elements, then the count changes a little bit. It gets to 230. If you allow only conjugation by uh, elements with a positive determinant. And they also counted, that, that's easier to do, but you, you can find Exactly 70 such groups if you do this in R2. Um, and maybe to go beyond in the, these uh, historical origins, I'm told, I have not checked, but I'm told that in, uh, if you look at the, um, the geometric art of tiling in, in Islamic architecture, then all 17 groups show up if you look hard enough. So it's quite possible that people tried to look systematically at those issues even before Schoenfis uh, and Theodor. So the, the, that was motivated by crystallography because when you have, <coughs> when you have a crystal, then there's its symmetry group and, and you might be interested in how, uh, in what types of symmetry group exist. And prompted by this in 1900, Gilbert asked a Different question, I mean, a, a more general question. And the Paris Congress, uh, Hilbert, 1900. Uh, well, what he asked is if we call this, this number n sub 3, where 3 is the dimension. Gilbert's question was, is every, um, uh, every co-compact uh, isometric action uh, 
on RD, assign action. Uh, virtually ZD, question mark, um, and is the number of such actions up to conjugation uh, finite? And this was one of the first uh, Hilbert's problems that, that got an answer. It's, uh, well, Hilbert's question was a little bit more general than this, but uh, in, in this group context, Biebebach answered it. In, uh, well, roughly 10 years later, he said yes and yes. So we have this, uh, these Biebebach theorems. I think the first statement is called Biebebach's first theorem, and the second is uh, Biebebach's second. Um, now, in, uh, the, the reason that Hilbert's question was a little bit more general is that he did not quite, uh, he did not exactly uh, enforce the presence of a group action. He was more generally asking about tilings because if you, if you do crystallography and atoms that, that connect to each other, they may have local ways that they like to connect to each other without necessarily knowing that, that the tiling is completely regular space. You might recognize this as a, as a description, a very hand wavy description of what happens in, in quasi crystals. And in fact, uh, in, in uh, the 1930s, Reinhardt uh, proved that there exist um, uh, polyhedra non-convex polyhedra. Polyhedra in R3 that tile and isohedrally. They tile, but there is no uh, no group that preserves everything that preserves the tiling. Um, so Hilbert was aware of this possibility. What he was not aware of was that, oh sorry, I think I got the decade wrong. It's in the 20s. Hilbert asked if such funny things could happen in dimension three. What he was not aware of was that it already happens in dimension two. So a little bit, sometime later, H showed the same thing in R2. So tilings are complicated. And maybe that's a bit of a, dis a digression, but you could, um, I guess one reason it's complicated is that you, is that you can embed a Turing machine into a tiling problem. You, you can uh, uh, tile the, the plane by square tiles with um, constraints on which types of tiles, let's say they have colors with, or, or squiggly shapes around their edges, which tiles can be adjacent to each other. And let's say the, the, the first row of tiles is the state of your Turing machine at time zero, then the rules of, uh, of uh, adjacency enforce that the next row above is the state of your Turing machine at time one, and so on. So uh, this kind of situation su suggests that you can embed all sorts of crazy stuff in tiling questions. Um, okay, so back to history. Uh, quasi, oh, okay. Uh, in the since then, we have found that quasi-crystals actually do occur in nature. So, so these are these uh, objects in, in, from Reinhardt's results are not not just uh, mathematical curiosities. They they, they can be studied uh, in physics also. And in the 1960s, Auslander asked the following uh, question. So generalizing uh, Hilbert's question, is it true, uh, is every Co-compact, so 
of an action on Rn virtually solvable. Um, remember, if you have a, a, a group that embeds into a matrix group, it's either virtually solvable or contains a free group, and it's its alternative. And virtually solvable should be seen as, as uh, groups close to, to ZD in some sense. Um, so the difference uh, between this and Hilbert's question is, of course, that you drop isometric. And little progress has been made. It's, uh, I'm going to say a little bit more uh, after this. In uh, another conjecture from the same era is Marcus, Marcus conjecture. Yes, the conjecture is that the answer is yes. I state it as a question. Oh, Marcus' question, um, does it preserve or properly discontinuous, is understood? Does it preserve a volume form? Also unknown. Um, now, in the 70s, Milner asked, can you drop the co-compact assumption from Auslander's conjecture? And the, uh, the answer to this came, uh, in the, came a few years later. In the 80s, early 80s, around 1980, um, Margulis said, no, uh, there exist proper actions, properly discontinuous actions by the free group F2 on R3, in fact, R21. Um, and the reason they, they do not fail the Auslander conjecture is that the quotient is not compact. So the, the Coxter group examples are, that I just spoke about are generalizations of Margulis' uh, construction. Um, so since then, some progress has been on the, on the Auslander conjecture. I think the most uh, recent result in that direction is that uh, theorem Abel's Margulis and Seufer um, the answer to Auslander's uh, question is yes in dimension uh, up to six. And uh, their proof is, uh, uses a lot of, uh, use, uh, uses the classification of Lie groups in uh, by a sort of case-by-case -case examination. Um, Milga, more recently, so this is from the year, I guess, uh, 2005 or so, roughly 
in the 2000s. And here I'm <coughs> so well be before I state Smilga's theorem, I'm going to say a little bit about the general uh, question, the general setting. We have a discrete group that lives in a Lie group that embeds or virtually embeds by a, a representation rho into GL of V, GL of a vector space. Now, uh, this is the linear part, and we ask ab about whether there exist uh, affine deformations of this linear part. We can add translational uh, perturbations to all of these, to rho of gamma, such that the, the group relations stay satisfied and the, the action is properly discontinuous on, on D. So, um, you have uh, G plus gamma uh, embedded in G semi-direct rho V. in affine, the affine group of D, admit properly discontinuous additive perturbations, I guess. Now, <clears throat> for this to happen, one thing you certainly need is for the um, or rho of gamma, all the elements rho of gamma, uh, to have one as, eigen, as an eigenvalue. For this to happen, we need uh, one to belong to the eigenvalues. All gamma in gamma, because well, uh, let's let's take gamma torsion free. We can always do this uh, up to finite index. The reason we need this is that, indeed, otherwise x. So the, the affine transformation x maps to um, rho of gamma x plus V will always have a fixed point. Hence, uh, cannot act, so even a single cyclic subgroup, the, the subgroups, the affine subgroup generated by such a map, uh, cannot act properly discontinuously. Right? Because if you look for a, a fixed point of this map, what you're going to write is rho of gamma minus identity um, of x equals v. And if rho of gamma minus identity is, is invertible, in other words, if one is not in the spectrum, then you just take the preimage of v and there's your fixed point. Um, therefore, The Zariski closure, in fact, of uh, rho of gamma as a subgroup of GLV uh, must also, so, so this is an algebraic subgroup, must also have one in the spectrum of every element. You can see how this is not a uh, trivial uh, property for a subgroup of GLV to have. For example, if we are acting on R3, then R21 is, a, uh, uh, I mean, SO21 is a good place to start because if you take an element of SO21, its eigenvalues will typically be lambda, one, and lambda inverse, and one is, uh, is, uh, is good. Um, and in fact, so th this has another name, must also, uh, 
If you study Lie group, this is called have zero as a weight. And you can see how the, the study of Lie groups can, might tell you about which subgroups of GL6 or something have zero as a weight, and then you, you, distinguish, you distinguish many cases. So that's the strategy that Abel's Margulis cipher followed. And um, <clears throat> okay, so in general, uh, let's see. In general, uh, if you take K sub G, a subset of G, a maximal compact subgroup. lowercase k it's Lie algebra uh, take its orthogonal complement so G for us is a semi-simple semi Lie group I'm going to say something about which representations allow for this uh, for this uh, type of examples. Uh, take Q to be its orthogonal complement. U is just k perp. It's not a Lie algebra, but it's the, the orthogonal complement for uh, the, the killing two form. Um, take A in K, uh, max, a maximal abelian. Uh, Subalgebra. Sorry, a in Q. A billion subalgebra. In the in the example with SLN, uh, K is going to be S O N, um, and A. Well, capital A, the exponential of lowercase a, is just a group of diagonal matrices. Um, and then there's a group called L, the centralizer of A in uh, G. Now I can state Smilger's theorem. From a few years ago, I think, 2016, he says the following. If G, a semi-simple D group, um, comes with a representation rho into G L of V, and um, There exists V uh, in V, a vector, such that LV equals V. So everything has been set up exactly in such a way that this means zero is a weight. So that's the necessary condition that we, we had before. That you, have, you always have one in the spectrum of the elements. And you need more than that. A W zero twiddle of V is different from V, where W zero twiddle uh, is the element of G, an element of G that lifts longest element of the vial group. Uh, 
W, which is by definition just the normalizer in G of A, divided by the centralizer. So here, uh, W is, is essentially S, uh, the, the, the symmetric group on N elements. It's the, the permutation of the, of the coordinates of Rn. Um, and this group in general, uh, if, you, if you follow the theory of Lie groups to that far, this group is always a finite Oxter group. There exist finite Oxter groups, by the way, unlike those we uh, worked with. Um, then, There exists uh, a subgroup gamma in G uh, discrete free. So basically, it's, it's enough to do a rank two free group. Uh, the risky dense. Such that um, Rho of gamma admits properly discontinuous affine deformations. So acting on V, right? So uh, manifold quotients modeled on V. Uh, for example, one uh, important example of this that Smilga uh, dealt with uh, previously, I mean, that's, that was a theorem he, he published before. Example, take for rho the adjoint action. Uh, from G to S O G with its killing event. Killing by linear form. So <clears throat> this uh, this uh, adjoint action is the one we worked with in the theorem on Coxta groups by, by looking at infinitesimal deformations. Basically, these the reason these uh, affine deformations. Add, add an additive uh, perturbation are the same as infinitesimal deformations, perturb your, your group a little bit, is that this space here uh, on which we act, the, the linear, the, the, the Lie algebra of G is the space of infinitesimal elements of G. Um, all right, so if we step back a little bit, once we we look at the, the situation here. I've said something about how um, how generally we can make the group gamma. And that was the result on Coxter group. You can you can take right-angled Coxter groups here. I've said something about what type of representation you can you can take here. And I'd like now to go in a third direction, which is to to show, okay. Um, what is the space, does the space of properly discontinuous additive perturbations uh, have structure? It was the full space of properly discontinuous perturbations that we can explore. Additive perturbation means you, you, have, you are given the linear part, how, how, uh, so that's rho. And this is obviously not a properly discontinuous action on V because it fixes the origin. And an additive perturbation just means you add a translation to each uh, element, and that's, yeah, that's an additive perturbation. What I was just saying is that an infinitesimal perturbation, okay, so I'll, I'll go back to the, the most basic example of, uh, of uh, Markovitz in R21 and, uh, and the, the free group. 
and say a little bit about what the space of properly discontinuous perturbations looks, li looks like and uh, what kind of structures it carries. Uh, say this again. So if Auslander's conjecture is true, then no. And uh, if you work in the uh, adjoint representation, I think you can give a homological dimension argument that shows it, it can't possibly be, uh, be co-compact because of the virtual cohomological dimension of your uh, discrete group is at most the dimension of the, the symmetric space attached to G. And that's much smaller than the dimension of the Lie algebra. And to be co-compact, you, you would need equality of the two dimensions. So it's, it's pretty hard to, I mean, a consequence, okay, a consequence of the Coxter group also uh, is that uh, there exist gamma acting on V affinely properly discontinuously with a vertical, virtual uh, cohomological dimension of gamma arbitrarily large but um, the dimension of V has to grow much much faster I mean, this is based on, on examples of, uh, of uh, uh, right-angled coxter groups with arbitrarily large cohomological dimension and, and those are constructed by a, by a kind of inductive process where you need to add up many many uh, generators each time you want to to uh, raise the the dimension by one the dimension of v is much larger larger Auslander conjectured uh, says it must be larger Must be at least one more. Okay, so uh, deformation spaces. So we'll go back to um, gamma being the fundamental group of a hyperbolic surface. Uh, maybe it has some genus. It must have some boundary components. And uh, we look at the Fuchsian representation. Um, SO2, one. And what do we want? Uh, okay, so there, there's a theorem if I combine uh, Margulis and, and uh, Goldman, Laburi, Mar Margulis. Um, that says affine, uh, well, it's a it's a converse to the contraction theorems I gave in the in the first lecture. So it says that um, an affine an affine deformation of rho is properly discontinuous if and only if. Let's call it U, the deformation. If or only if U shortens all loops in S uh, uniformly, 
uh, or minus u, in fact. It can be one or the other. Uh, it's not clear whether some whether a, a converse like this will exist in general, but in the case of SO21, it's a full, it's a complete equivalence. Um, now, again, this is using the fact that a, a that this being the Lie algebra uh, of The 2 1 representation of the of SO2 1 is also the adjoint representation. And so we can see uh, affine deformations as infinitesimal deformations. That's the, sen that's the sense in which uh, curves should shorten. Now, example. So, uh, moreover, By an argument of, I, I guess I can attribute this to Thurston. Um, it's enough to focus on simple loops. The idea is that if you have a, a loop that has self-intersection and that becomes longer under the perturbation, then you can find a, uh, another loop that has slightly less self-intersection. I mean, th th there's, there may be some self-intersection that I'm not showing, but it definitely intersects here. You perturb the surface, so the geodesic loop changes, it moves, but uh, up to looking at this, the correct quadrant here, you can assume that uh, the angle theta goes up. Uh, make a perturbation. And then, so if uh, L lengthens, oh, sorry, I should call this gamma, the loop gamma lengthens, then it becomes a little bit longer and the, the angle opens up, then this other loop will become even longer. It's some trigonometry argument uh, that, that you can do in, uh, that explicitly. L prime, the, the orange loop, lengthens even more, in fact. As a consequence of negative curvature, th things tend to, if you, if you, launch two particles on straight lines, they, their distance tends to increase in a, in a convex way. It's a convex function of time. If you look at greater distances than the length of L, they are even further apart when, when launched from the, the origin here. It's some trigonometry, you can, you can uh, think about this as an exercise. So if we <coughs> focus on the example of the surface uh, given by a pair of pounds, um, then rho, well, d over dt rho t, which is our perturbation, our co-cycle u, is shortening if and only if all three cuffs uh, shorten. So a, a hyperbolic metric on this surface is given by the lengths of the three boundary loops. So that's a, uh, a three-dimensional space. And if I projectivize the tangent space at rho of um, uh, phi 1s uh, PSL2, I get a a, two, uh, a copy of the projective plane in which a triangle is bounded by three edges saying uh, uh, 
d l alpha equals zero along the first edge, d l beta, the second length, equals zero, and d l gamma equals zero along the third edge. And here, the, the triangle is the region in which uh, all the, the lengths shorten. So I'm out of time, but I'd like to draw just one more picture, which is what you get for the, for the punctured torus. Or uh, S equal to the punctured torus, the collection of all, so you can see this as R2 minus uh, R2 mod Z2 minus a disk. The collection of all simple closed curve is in, in uh, natural bijection with the uh, rational projective line. So that's just Q union infinity. And the, the correspondence, correspondence is just the slope. When you have, such, when you have a loop, you loop to R2, and, and that's a certain path that has a slope, a rational slope. And uh, here's your correspondence. So I claim that the, the domain, the, the cone of uh, proper deformations, in this case, will be bounded by a, a, some kind of infinite polygon with one side per element of uh, the rational projective line. So if you draw zero, one, infinity, each, each of them has a segment that says um, uh, D of the length of the loop of slope one equals zero along that edge. And there's also minus one, one half, two, three, and everything is convex. We could, have, we could have known ahead of time that everything was convex because the, the, the condition that all the lengths go down is a convex condition, just one linear condition for each uh, uh, slope. And ultimately, you get the proper deformations in here. And if you look at something called Markov maps, those are natural coordinates for the space of representations of, the, of this particular uh, fundamental group. Markov maps uh, can help you compute exactly the coordinates of those vertices. So you, you can just, you can write everything down and show that there's a full segment and you know the, the actual endpoints. So the, uh, what you could do next is, is uh, express those deformations uh, in terms of certain uh, shapes, laminations, curves, whatever, subsurfaces in S. And I'll stop here. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. So I hope we can ask Francois questions during tea time. Yeah, so let's thank. Thank you very much for the course. So th thank the speaker again. <laughs>